Good evening, everyone. I'm Lonnie Stonich, the Executive Director of FAN, and I'm excited to welcome you to a great conversation tonight between Ada Calhoun and Deborah Siegel Acevedo. Thanks for attending. We're a nonprofit organization that presents a high quality speaker series offered free to the public on a wide variety of topics, including human development, mental health, education, and social justice, just to name a few. We have over 100 videos of past events archived on our website and our YouTube channel for free public viewing, so be sure to explore. And now for formal introductions of tonight's guests. Journalist Ada Calhoun is the author of the New York Times bestseller, Why We Can't Sleep, Women's New Midlife Crisis, an expansion of her viral story for Oprah.com about the unique circumstances faced by Generation X women. Ms. Calhoun is also the author of the memoir, Wedding Toasts I'll Never Give, and the history, St. Mark's is Dead. She has collaborated on several New York Times bestsellers and written for the New York Times, New York Magazine, and the New Republic. Deborah Siegel Acevedo is the author of Sisterhood Interrupted, From Radical Women to Girls Gone Wild. She's the co-editor of Only Child, a TEDx speaker, and the founder of the new online course collective, Bold Voice Collaborative. Her essays and op-eds have appeared in venues, including the Washington Post, The Guardian, CNN.com, The Forward, Gaveller, Slate, The Huffington Post, The American Prospect, Ms. Moore, and Psychology Today. She's an adjunct faculty member in the College of Communication at DePaul University and a visiting scholar in gender and sexuality studies at Northwestern University. So now let's welcome Ada Calhoun and Deborah Siegel Acevedo. Thank you, Lonnie. Hi, Ada. Hi, Deborah. Thank you, Lonnie. So good to see you. Great to see and you. Thank you to all the sponsors. It's a delight to be here. And I have to say that uh, one of the sponsors is my alma mater high school. Hi, new chair. Uh -huh. <laughs> so uh, before we get started, Ada, I know you have a little disclaimer about the title. Um, do you want to tell everybody whether we are or not, for instance, sleep doctors? <laughs> We were not sleep doctors. It's funny. There are a couple of comments um, or questions early that were like, they were like, how can I fall asleep? So the book talks a little about sleep, um, but basically sleep is a metaphor for all the things affecting us in midlife. So I was telling you earlier, Deborah, it could be called why we drink or why we throw our phone against the wall or various other things. Why we scream at our husband or partner and children all the time when we're Thank trying you. to work. <laughs> at home and remote school, right? Yeah. So I want to start by offering a little bit of terminology by way of explaining some of the terms that I think will really be the bedrock of our conversation tonight, just to make sure that everybody who's watching is up to speed. So I'm going to do this in the form of like rapid, rapid fire. I'll That's throw like you ready. a term and you like throw me how you define it. Okay, ready. Ready? Yeah. All right. Generation X. Okay, so a lot of people say different things, but basically born 65 to 80, you know, I, if, you, if you had a koosh ball, if you had pins on your jean jacket, if you know what sound a dial-up modem makes, these are all signs you may be Generation X. Okay, and uh, you're born in, just so we- Right said, in the middle-ish, 76, so yeah. And I'm 1969, so I'm old Gen X, but I squeaked in. You're right in there, yeah. Just barely made the 60s. <laughs> well, it's funny, um, a lot of younger um, boomers and older millennials relate to pretty much everything in the book. And also the book is geared toward women, um, but a lot of men have told me that everything except the menopause chapter, they feel like they can really- But relate. they should know about the menopause chapter. I mean- Yes. Yeah, yes. No. I think so, so, okay, next term, you ready? Yes. Crisis. Okay, so a lot of women who I interviewed rejected this term. They're like, I'm not going through a crisis. That's, you know, that's for men with the sports cars and the girlfriends. Um, you know, it's for me, it is just, uh, you know, a funk or just, you know, a really sad time or a hard time. Um, but, you know, the more they talk, the more I realize there's a lot going on in a lot of these women's lives. It's very, very hard. Um, and I just thought it was a big deal. So I, you know, I use the word crisis because I, I, I think we, we don't give enough attention to the way that we're feeling. Thank you. I, I think crisis is, yeah, it's a word that says, pay attention, something's going on here, right? And we'll get into this a little bit more, but you talk about the expectations of the American dream that many of us, not all of us, but you know, many of us grew up with, continued gender inequality, downward mobility, 
et cetera, et cetera, new kind of midlife crisis, right? So um, how about the women that you interviewed? You say 200 women interviewed. Can you define that a little bit more? Yeah, so um, so I didn't talk to very rich women. I didn't really talk to very poor women. I tried to stay with um, the sort of the vast middle um, class-wise. It's very diverse uh, racially and geographically. Um, that was really important to me because I feel like a lot of the books about middle age, first of all, a lot of them are about men. I'd say most of them are about men. Um, and then if they are about women, a lot of times they're just about like, you know, five white women in Brooklyn or something like that. So I wanted it to be as diverse as possible. And how did you find those diverse women and what kind of diversity are we talking about? Well, the real advantage um, to doing the story first as a story for Oprah Dot com was that I was able to use their social media channels to cast a very wide net and um, and so I sent out a call basically you know are you are you dealing with any of the following issues in your life and I got just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of messages back from all over the country um, and I so that was where I started but then I reached out to like community groups all over and I really worked to make sure that like if I didn't have any women in Texas or you know things like that I, I would sort of go either go there physically, um, which I did in certain cases, um, or reach out to, to groups there. And can you talk a little bit about the racial diversity? of the Yeah, that was really important to me because I feel like that is something that a lot of times um, just gets overlooked in sort of survey-ish stuff like this. Um, so yeah, I, I tried to make it look like America, the, the demographics of the book. So um, so it's it really does break down pretty close to what the country is. And I didn't, I put like a little author's note in the front saying, explaining my methodology and what I did and everything, but I didn't put tags in front of everybody's name, like white woman from Atlanta, who's 44 and, you know, going through a divorce because I got so cluttered. Um, so just for a smoother reading experience, I didn't do that. And we can talk a little bit more about that. Cause I, I'd be curious, what would the book sound like if you did, you know, would, what would change? Would you have written, you know, would it's it have- sociological, I think, and less like a conversation. So, you know, is it just a choice I made because I'm a journalist yeah. and not an academic. So. Yeah. yeah. The one thing that I want to um, hone in on too, when you talk about, uh, you know, that we're talking about class, right? We're talking about a very specific class background here. I love this quote um, that you begin early in the book. You say, we are fortunate in so many ways. America today in the global scheme of things offers us far more opportunity than our grandmothers or mothers had. Although many women are trying to make it out of minimum wage jobs and have a crisis not specific to middle age, the overall wage gap is closing. Men do more at home. There's more pushback against sexism. Insert your reason why we don't deserve to feel lousy here. There's uh, the complaints of the well-educated middle and upper middle class women are easy to disparage as a temporary setback, a fixable hormonal imbalance or hashtag first world problems. Fine, let's agree, you say, that Generation X women shouldn't feel bad. So why do we? And that leads me to like the next term in our rapid fire, <laughs> downward mobility, discuss. Yes. So, um, so a lot of the women that I interviewed were told growing up, you know, you can be anything, even president, and that, that we were on this, this upward climb in terms of, you know, feminist achievement, and then also in terms of money, like in terms of we're going to just do better and better than our parents and our grandparents. Um, and this generation did not, is not, um, our next generation is not. Um, they, we are downwardly mobile, and it, it's very different than what we were raised to believe was going to happen. Um, and I think that's led to a lot of anxiety and a lot of self-recrimination in people that maybe they could let go of if they knew more about what we're facing um, just demographically. So putting it in the wider context of where we're having these crises in the country and the economy that we're in, I have to say, I'm not gonna ask for a show of hands, um, but I'm happy to help offer myself up as exhibit A, your poster girl um, for why we can't sleep. Although I'm sleeping a lot better now, I have to say since the election and other things, but um, I grew up in Winnetka and I met my left life partner in New York City when I was 38. So the demographic that you're talking about, women in your book, a lot of us married later, or if we married at all. Um, I got pregnant with twins at 39. So again, delayed child rearing. Just when my partner lost his job during the 2008 Great Recession. And I had the awareness then that this was part of a generational shift because 
at that point, I think men more than women were losing jobs in that particular recession. I know that this particular economic recession has had greater fallout and economic impact on women. So it's interesting. Um, I'm not an economist and I don't play one on TV. So I, you know, but I just want to throw out that I started writing this column called Love in the Time of Layoff because I thought that it was, you know, there was something going on here. And I wanted to talk about it from the uh, breadwinning woman perspective, right? Whose partner had just lost a job. Laid off again, my partner laid off again in April, 2020. There is no way I ever expect to do as well as my live in Winneka, you know, old side of boomer parents have done. Though I certainly grew up with that kind of white privilege and class privilege that told me to try and to shoot for the stars. Mm -hmm. And so I do feel like in a sense, again, a certain demographic, you know, feeling like hmm, we're kind of sold a bill of goods, this have it all Michigas to throw in a little Jewish, um, you know, that, that we're exhausted um, and we see it, we're a generation that's trained to see that exhaustion as personal failure rather than structural problems with structural solutions. And you know, I've written about second wave feminism and third wave feminism, you know, the different generations of feminism. And I hope that future generations of women might be more prone to blowing things up again. Um, which brings me to the question that, you know, I think there's an interesting tension in your book between hope and cynicism. And, you know, I think there's that there's, you talk about solace in the end. I don't want to, you know, spoiler alert, I'm not going to give away what the solution is or, you know, if there is one, but I think we should talk a little bit about how we talk about solutions because you, you go back and forth between solace. Um, you know, there's solace to be had and the game is rigged. And we know that the game is rigged in so many of these, you know, different dimensions. So can you talk about where you come down ultimately, you know, in your heart, in your head, um, and with boots on the ground on the hope cynicism continuum? Sure. Yeah. So um, all of that very well put, and I'm glad to be talking to a, a feminist historian and such a smart one. So thank you again for doing this. Um, but, you know, I will say that a lot of the women that I spoke with were very dismissive of their own feelings. They would say like, you know, I don't deserve to feel bad. I'm so lucky. I'm so fortunate. Um, but then you like, you look at what they're up against and it's, you know, it's pretty daunting. And what I found in writing the book and researching the book myself is that just learning how bad it is on so many levels and how, how much the dice were loaded um, is very validating and very soothing on a kind of profound level, more soothing in my experience than all of the like new year, new you stuff we're getting pelted with right now because it's, you know, right after January. You know, I think there's this illusion that we are going to fix whatever is ailing us psychically um, by like cleaning out our closet right or getting the right diet app or, you know, what it's like all these like little things. And I I heard over and over again in the women I talked to that um, that being told what to do to fix themselves or to fix their finances or to fix their marriage or to fix their parenting, that it was this pile up of advice that actually was part of what was crushing them. Um, just more on the to-do list. The to-do list is already quite long if you're trying to, to take care of everybody around you and work full time, you know, and pay the mortgage and work in the community and all this other stuff and look great and whatever else you're, you have on your list. Um, also trying to like, just feel like everything's great and you've meditated and you've like done Pilates and you've done all these things, um, it's, it's too much. So I think the, the book in a way is a little more macro than like solutions. It's really about, um, like you said, solace and community um, and this sense that like we're all in this together. And I mean, I get emails every day from women who read the book and they say, um, one of two things. They say, I feel seen, that this is like an experience that I've been having inside that I didn't have like words for. Um, and I feel less alone. And I get that a lot. And it makes me feel less alone because I just think that that's, that's something we need as a, as, you know, as human beings. And that gives me chills as somebody interested in feminist history too, to, to think about that. And in the longer game of that, you beautifully inscribe the book to, you know, you, you write for the middle-aged women of America, you're not imagining it and it's not just you, right? And I think in doing that, your book becomes part of this longer trajectory that dates all the way back to Betty Friedan's The Feminine Mystique, right? And it's so interesting too, you know, the, the theme that comes up over and over that you say the women 
express is that we were supposed to have solved this by now. Like it's, yeah. you know, it's us to have solved it. And if we don't, we suck, right? Yeah. We just need to do more Pilates or swim three times a week or <laughs> radically accept ourselves or self-care or wellness <laughs> movement or all those things, right? right. Um, but the predominant feeling that I get after reading your book is that the personal is political still, mm -hmm. you know, that we are still having the same issues, yeah. capital I, that we've had for generations and generations now, since, you know, since forever, <laughs> uh, really, but, you know, in, in white middle-class feminism history, you know, kind of started naming that um, in the late 60s and, and early 70s, of course, women of color have been having these issues from the beginning of time, and um, so I, I'm curious about, um, you know, you advocate getting together with other women as, you know, and, and again, I'm not gonna give it away, gotta read the book to get to the end, but I, I, I'm very heartened by, you know, somebody who wants to fall, I mean, Gen X is really known for being cynical, right? Yeah. Where the, where the Gen X, the part of that X is like, whatever, right? <laughs> Slackers, blah, blah, blah. Um, which by the way, we're not, but. Which makes me crazy also, because I do think for for some men, especially male characters played by like Ethan Hawke, you know, in the, the movie. <laughs> The slacker, um, the slacker moniker is real, but I don't know one woman in this entire generation who's just like, what, you know, like just kicking back. No, we can't Not afford a kicking it. back generation no. of women no. for sure. And overachieving, if anything. Um, but I'm curious, you know, what kinds of gathering have is bringing you energy and life and hope these days? What do you see, you know, in terms of? I mean, you've been going around and talking to gener to audiences of women, even though it's been on. Zoom yeah. probably more than in real life. Well, this is real life. This is very much real life. This is very much real life, <laughs> right? I mean, in the before times. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm just, I'm curious how you have experienced communities and conversations. You know, what are some of the, the things that are giving people solace right now? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I want to plug yeah. your um, Bold Voice Collective because I think you're, what the work you're doing um, and also the work FAN is doing is, you know, it's really along these same lines that I'm talking about. It's something we need in a really profound way is to be in conversation with other people who are going through some of the same things as us. Um, it's very valuable. So w in the before times, I started a women's journalist bar night with a couple of writer friends of mine and we started having them and, um, and it was, you know, everybody from young, brand new baby journalists to like women in their seventies and won a bunch of Pulitzers and it was so fun. I mean, we just hung out and drank and had readings and we'd like bring in an agent to talk or a publicist or um, photographer or somebody. And, um, and it was just the best. I talk about it a little bit in the book. Um, it's, it does feel different on the internet every once in a while, you know, I'll have like one of these things and there you like, and actually I think it's great that um, we're doing after hours, which everybody should join us for if you'd like to. Um, I think details are in the chat. Um, but, you know, like I've had a few where women start sharing with one another and and it becomes this very beautiful moment of connection and um again i think it is about like being seen and being heard and um and realizing that you you have this community that you're not alone and that the personal is political too right that it's not just i'm crazy i can't handle it i can't hack it it's my fault there's something else going down. And that's something that I do hear a lot that I really like is the, is the like, I think Kelly Ripa said it on her show was like, was like, I'm not crazy. I thought I was crazy. And I read the book and then it's like, oh no, it's actually like a thing that we've all, we're all dealing with in various ways. Um, and that is exactly how I felt when I was researching the book that I, you know, this really did come again, like from a personal thing where I, um, you know, I was having this really horrible time and I just had a ton of credit card debt and, um, and I felt like my career was over and, I had like the one kid going into middle school and one going to college and like, it, and I was a breadwinner and it was a lot of pressure. Anyway, it was just everything kind of piling up. My parents are getting older. I'm an only child taking care of them. And, um, and it, it was just like every new study I read, every new number I saw, I was like, oh, like mm -hmm. I just had really bad expectations, like really the wrong expectations for how this was all gonna go. And once I realized that and like readjusted them, that went a very long way toward getting me out of the crisis that I was in. I want to go back to that and the stories, the st you know, how we think of our, our lives in terms of a narrative with the beginning, a middle and an end and what's supposed to happen and how to adjust. But I want to pick up on something you said, only child taking care of elderly parents. Me too. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, in Oneka. Um, 
you know, I think I, you say this, and I think part of what is so brilliant about it is your, your book is that you name things, right? You give this hazy sense of what's wrong, a name. And you also, I love your metaphors. You know, people have talked about the sandwich generation or the sandwich stage of life where you're taking care of kids and you're taking care of elderly parents. Well, now here we are in a pandemic, the during times, I guess, because we haven't yet reached the after times, you used the word before times. And we are taking care of our parents and you know, raising our children, if we have children, at the same time, and we're exhausted because if we have those children, we have them later. So now we're in the middle, you know, I'm 51. And you describe this not as a sandwich, but as a rack. Like I just pictured this like medieval torture rack with these things pulling, right? And the pandemic has only intensified everything. You know, here we are, like, I'm worried about my parents dying for all sorts of different reasons now, right? And my kids are homeschooling in a <laughs> crisis emergency way, right? So your book came out in 2020, be in the before times, yeah. right? And it and it started with a magazine article, as Lonnie said, in, in 2018. So you were writing it in 2018, 2019, feels like an eternity ago now. Um, what might be different, you know, if in, in how, I mean, this is kind of an impossible question, but I'm just curious, you know, how, what, everything that's in your book is in our lives even more so intensified now. The pandemic and the pandemic recession has just magnified what you're writing about, but we're also facing new pressures, right? And so, you know, we're just starting to learn, for instance, about what emergency homeschooling has done to women's careers. I saw a statistic about how the vast majority of women who opted out, we don't use that term anymore, you know, fell out, crashed out, were sent, whatever, um, you know, ha somebody had to take care of the children. And if you're in a two income household, yeah. guess who it's going to be, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and so that the majority of, of people who had fallen out of the workforce um, were female. And we know who's doing the majority of the remote schooling, um, at least in my house. I mean, I, I don't not going to speak for everybody, but like, come on, you know? Yeah. So I'm curious about, you know, if you were still writing this and I feel this way, like when I was writing Sisterhood Interrupted, the deadline was arbitrary. I could have, I could have still be writing that book, right? And, you know, the, the deadline is just something you have to file. But what do you think you would say now <laughs> to women who are experiencing midlife crisis in a pandemic? <laughs> How do we find solace in each other, in our movements, in our moments, you know, what, what has, what has that gotten you thinking about? It's really funny because actually the paperback, which just came out a couple weeks ago, um, I, I, for that, I was able to redo the introduction and add pandemic observations in because mm -hmm. I was hearing from so many women who were in the book or who had read the book that they saw it now as almost a prequel to the pandemic, this, this, yeah. all the things, all the ways that in, in, on one level we were set up to really crash because everything was so fragile, the job instability problem, the lack of savings, um, just all these different things. We, it, those were all made much, much worse by the pandemic. But at the same time, a lot of the skills we have as a generation, this amazing resilience, this ability to watch phenomenal amounts of television, um, you know, just all these different things made us actually quite well suited. And speaking of your, you know, the aging parents issue, I have been booking vaccination appointments for like all the older people in my life. So I got my parents, my aunt and uncle, and, yeah. um, and um, all I can think of is the nineties, like the radio call-in shows, you know, or, you know, where you call into the radio and be like, try to be caller number 57 or whatever it was, which, you right. know, 80s I, and 90s I was doing and um like those skills are the same ones now that like are life and death for for older people so um so again you know it's not it's not good none of it's good it's terrible time it's horrible and and gothic and miserable um it is there are certain, <laughs> there are certain ways in which though like I think we are um as a generation sort of built for it almost. I, th I think, you know, a lot of women told me there was all this anxiety beforehand waiting for the other shoe to drop. And then here it is. This is the other shoe. Yeah. It's a really heavy shoe. It is a really <laughs> heavy shoe. And actually it's, it's funny. It's, um, one friend of mine said this thing the other day, um, which is yeah, it's Janet Kennedy, who actually is a sleep expert. Um, and she has a site, she has a uh, 
business called New York City NYC Sleep. Um, she said, it is important to understand that even while life is monotonous, this situation is overstimulating. So I think about that a lot. Like there's this monotony to our days, but actually we are being barraged with all kinds of horrific news constantly. And with just the reality, like you said, of like our kids, if we have kids, um, just struggling with this online thing and then being lonely. I miss my friends so much. And, and you know, going through that, it's like the, the contrast, I think, between the, the sort of the sameness of the days and the intensity of the experience is there's, it's really a mind trip. So that's why we can't sleep now. <laughs> and, you know, and, yeah. My father's a psychiatrist and he often has been saying, you know, that that feeling you've been carrying around, or there was actually also an article that went around that was saying, you know, that feeling that you've been carrying that's making you exhausted all the time and that, you know, you're just feeling everything is an extra weight. It's hard to even, you know, sometimes pick up the phone. It's grief. Yeah. You know, yeah. there's a lot that we're processing and not processing. It's just too overwhelming for our systems. And so, yeah, I find myself up at 3 a.m., um, just doom scrolling, you know, a little bit less so in the last couple of weeks, but you know, still the, the other shoe could drop any moment. And, and How many shoes are all there? PTSD. <laughs> I know like, like training, shoes. Right now, training shoes with like poop on them, you know? <laughs> so um, what do you, you know, I'm curious what you would say um, to younger women you know, a lot of millennials and Gen Z, which is the post-millennial generation, right? Are reading the book. My kids are 11, I have twins, they're Gen Z also. So that's a broad swath, but they're not reading your book yet, but I'll make them when it's time. Um, but, you know, what is, what can they, what does Gen X's experience have to teach younger women? Just as, you know, we've, we grew up in the shadow of boomers and learned certain lessons, lessons about womanhood, about you know what we what we think um, we're supposed to be and what this life for us is supposed to look like, what can they learn from our exhaustion? Well, you know what I think is so interesting is if you look at our like grandmothers and mothers, like if they worked, it was usually nine to five, you know, and if they were um, if they had families, the families were out of the house by the time they were in their forties, and they weren't trying to do both those things at once while going through perimenopause and leaning in and whatever else. Um, we tried to do all that stuff. A lot of women are very, very tired. And I think the millennial women are seeing that and adjusting accordingly. So a lot of millennial women have written me and said that they read the book and that it made them think basically just about expectations of, of how it was gonna go. So if they were gonna do the thing where they wait to, you know, until their career is really established to have a family and their parents are getting older and all these things, it's going to be very difficult. Um, I think part of the, the hardness for us as a generation is that I think we were blindsided by it. We didn't have examples who had done this before. Um, and we had been told kind of brainwashed our whole lives by things like the Anjali commercial, you know, this would bring home the bacon, fried up in the pan, never let him forget he's a man, all this stuff like that it was going to be lovely, like just easy to do all these things at once and a, and a pleasure and a gift. Um, doing all the things with no help is not a gift that, you know, and, and people can tell you all day long, oh, it's so great how many opportunities you have. But if you don't have any support and you're trying to do all the opportunities all at once, um, that's not, it's not great. And so I think that millennial women can see that in us. I, you know, I've, I've heard from many of them who see it and are adjusting accordingly. And maybe it means that they are having kids younger um, you know, where they're not going to try to be taking care of aging parents and at the peak of their career while they have small children, they're making that calculation. Maybe they're deciding not to have kids because they're really driven and they just want to give everything to their work. Um, you know, I, I just think it's, they're better informed. I think we weren't, I think we didn't have that information or that knowledge. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. I hope I hope that this isn't a cycle that just keeps repeating and repeating and repeating. The cynical part of me, the Gen X side of me is, you know, is sort of um, wanting to fire things up and shake things up some more and, you know, go watch, march on Washington and wherever we need to march, right? Um, and I think it's, uh, you know, and, and we are the women's marches and yet 
what did they accomplish? But no. I do think actually, you know, on that tip, I do see in millennial millennials, male and female and Gen Z. Um, so I have a millennial stepson and a Gen Z son. Um, they are much more demanding than we were. I feel like they're yeah. much more, um, right. they, they really, they think things should be different and they're going to fight yeah. for things to be different. And I don't know that we did that as much. Or I, I, you know, I, I saw that with like me too, where younger women were like, this is not acceptable. And I yeah. think back on the things that I put up with, you know, early in jobs and that kind of thing. And I'm just like, huh, <laughs> I guess you're yeah. right. Um, I, I just, I think we may be tolerated a lot um, again, because we didn't have a lot of frame of reference, maybe. Um, so I, I do think maybe things will change under them. I, I believe a lot in the younger generations. I think they're going to yeah. do great things. They give me great hope. Yeah. Climate for Black Lives Matter for you know living in a just, yeah a better world. And gender and gender um, roles. I think there's a there's much more fluidity in younger yeah. generations than I, I think. Gen X is, is much better um, than the boomer generation in terms of men sharing household responsibilities and that kind of thing. But if you look at the numbers, it's really, it's not, it's not amazing. Whereas I think for the younger generations, I just, you know, I see my, my son and stuff and his friend, their friends, and it's like, it's just different. You can see it. And I think that boys and men really expect to do much, much more. Yeah. And I, I think that's wonderful. I think it's going to be, it's going to be better for them. Speaking of fluidity and just different identities that are um, more available because they, you know kids these days are seeing more models. I'm wondering if you could speak to single women in your books. I know you interview a lot of single women um, and you also interviewed um, some gay women that had their stories and live in your pages. And I'm just curious if, you know, what you can, because we've been kind of talking about the coupled, married, heterosexual, yeah. straight women. I'm wondering if you could talk about um, some of the women who aren't those things. Yes. And how this crisis is affecting them differently. Yeah, so there's one There's one story about um, a friend of mine who um, she was trying to get pregnant. She um, She's gay, so they, it was, there was an added sort of thing to it, which is that they had to, you know, order sperm and all that. Um, and she wound up having her first baby on her 44th birthday. <laughs> and she just had her, um, her second baby, like actually not that long ago. Um, and, and she's, I think she's 46. So, um, that's, so that's one story that I tell of like her path toward it, but you know, and, and so a lot of the things are, are similar across the board, which is like, she was really driven in her career and she was really motivated in that. And she waited and waited, but also she was trying to find a partner who was ready to, to do this with her. Um, and that was a story I heard from a lot of straight and um, gay women that, that there was this real difficulty a lot of times in, in getting on the same page with another person and making all the timing line up, especially if you'd waited and then you're sort of in this time crunch. So that was a story I heard kind of again and again, like, you know, women getting to their thirties, mid thirties, and then thinking like, oh, I really sort of thought I was going to have a family by now. I don't, I should sort of get on that. Or maybe they're in their forties. Um, and then having to try to figure it out with this sort of like, you know, clock going. Um, and especially this, the straight women saying like, you know, and the men are like not on the, the clock at all in, in that, um, that time zone. And I spoke with a lot of women who had thought they were gonna have families um, and didn't, and had sort of had to reconcile themselves to the fact that it might not ever happen. And this one therapist I spoke with, um, and I do also, I should say, I did talk to a lot of women who never wanted kids, never wanted a partner, totally happy with that part, had other issues. Um, but this one therapist told me this thing that I think about all the time actually now because of the pandemic, which is this term ambiguous loss. Mm -hmm. She said the thing that human beings do the worst with is uncertainty, that there's something about the brain that just like hates not knowing. And that there's a real difference between like even death where you, you can mourn and you know that it's over and this kind of like nebulous, you're not really sure what's going to happen. So she said, you know, if you're in this place where you want a partner um, and you don't know if you're going to meet that person this afternoon at the grocery store or never, um, that you have this sense of loss and it is incredibly painful. Um, so I, I think about that a lot now because I think it applies to so much. I think it's, you know, we don't know when this the pandemic's gonna be over. We don't know when we'll see our friends. Um, and also I would say that in lockdown, 
a lot of my friends who were maybe trying to have families and that kind of thing um, feel it even more because here it is like trying to date on mm -hmm. Zoom and, you know, find somebody and your like fertile years are go going, going, gone. And it's just like, there is something about that that's, um, that I think hasn't been talked enough about. And that's something else too in the book. I really wanted to talk to women on both sides of that, like sort of too much caretaking or no caretaking, um, because I think we get pitted against one another as groups in a weird way in the media a lot, like the whole mommy wars, like yeah, parenting, helicopter parenting. Yeah, I, mean, I just think there's this sense of like, you know, we're all in the same boat. This is a, you know, generational thing. And whether we made this choice or that choice or had this choice or that choice thrust upon us, um, we have more in common than we don't, so. And that boat is sinking. Right? <laughs> <laughs> the point of boat. So the boat is sinking, but also, you know, you end on an, again, a note of hope, I think. Um, and, and there's a line in your book where you say um, that writing this book cured your midlife crisis. And I'm wondering if we could just get a little personal. I mean, I'll, I'll share if you will, you know, <laughs> just, um, you know, just how did writing this book cure the crisis? Um, you talk about, you know, rejiggering your story and how you carry your story. Uh, you teach memoir writing, and I'm interested in how, you know, you write about making meaning in the process of structuring a story. So how did structuring the story and making meaning by writing this book help to cure the malaise that you were experiencing? Yeah, so when I teach memoir, one of the hardest things and best things about it is, um, is trying to figure out who the characters are in the book and what the beginning and the middle and the end of your story are and what are the major scenes and um, and is it is it a tale of glory or a sad you know tale or whatever it is um, and that you're that you're the hero of the book like you're your own hero and once you start trying to tell your story in that way and to make sense of it I think it's very powerful to actually get this idea of what each thing means like what does it mean that you went to um, you know you went to school for this but then you wound up doing this or you know whatever it is that you're trying to make sense of. Um, I think it's kind of pow powerful to make those assertions when you're when you're writing them um, down. So for me, you know, I, I found all this work so liberating. I thought, you know, talking to these women and doing this research, I just suddenly felt like, oh, I, I see it. I see the story better. And I see it as not as like, we were so oppressed and we had this, you know, we were doomed and it was terrible. Although I know that there, there are elements of that to our story. Um, but, you know, we had a hard road to hoe and we've done so much. I mean, women, especially in this generation, like so well-educated, have made so many achievements, have these children who are going to change the world. Like it's, it's good news. It's, it's, it's good. So there is good news. On the <laughs> yes. Good to hear. I think, yeah, I'm in awe of my female friends who I, fairly can talk to because we're so busy living this pandemic and this midlife life, right? But when I do talk to them, I am in awe, you know, of them individually and collectively and what they are pulling off. Mm -hmm. um, the resilience is stunning. And um, so I have hope, I have hope in, in that sense as well. I have to say, speaking personally, I, you know, at first I was like, I am totally your poster girl. I, you know, Sleep aside, I'm not going to go into the sleep itself, you know, that's, we started out talking about this, not really what we're talking about. Um, but, you know, I was, I was a poster girl demographically, class-wise, you know, uh, economically, layoffs, da, 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 right? I shared a little bit about my narrative. But I think as, my, as our twins hit preschool, we were living in New York, we couldn't afford it anymore. We decided consciously to move back home. I grew up in Winneka. We now live in Evanston and my parents are 15 minutes away. And that has made all the difference. You know, we have our village. Most of my friends here do not. Yeah. Um, I should say, actually, I should say most of my white friends here do not. Most of my friends of color here do. And I think that, or well, I'm thinking specifically of African-American friends. I think that whether you have your village, whether you're living in an intergenerational context of support, you know, whether you have some kind of um, extended 
structures that are helping you make it through the day. And, you know, we've lost that now, those of us whose parents were involved in caring for our children, like not going near there in a hazmat suit, you know, mm -hmm. but um, I think that that makes a huge difference. And that that is, you know, why the boat is sinking for so many is because they don't have, you know, we don't live near um, extended families and we aren't a village. And we don't yet live in co-housing where we have this, you know, I have, I have one friend out in Oakland who has this like beautiful model of this intergenerational housing situation. And I'm just like, ah, uh -huh, you know, um, so. A lot yeah. of the ones that I talked to, they were saying that they felt like they had to do everything themselves, you know, or it wouldn't get done right. Or they just, they just had to do it all for whatever reason. Um, and that was one other lesson that I took away from those conversations was I started asking for way more help. I started trying to, to really assemble this like Ocean's Eleven style support team. Um, you know, I made sure that I had like a pet sitter and a good gynecologist and a, and a good accountant and like all these different, this staff basically compiled of, you know, mostly free labor. Um, and, and it changed, it changed a lot. It really did make it way, way better having that. So I think support from other women kind of emotionally and connections and clubs and groups um, and community, and then actual like legitimate support from experts or friends who can help you with certain things. Um, and then it's also recognizing it's like a period of time. That was something else that really helped me. Mm -hmm. You know, this is a hard time of life for everybody. And I think perimenopause, we don't, don't talk about that enough, but that's, you know, it's a big deal. It's a big change. Let's and, talk about perimenopause for a moment. Okay. We don't talk about it enough. And, <laughs> and men listening need to know about this as well, just as, you know, our boys need to be educated and, um, you know, girls periods, we need to have this conversation and make it come out of the closet. Right. So, uh, I was really interested to find that, um, you mentioned, uh, that women, white women had experienced the duration and symptoms differently than Japanese and Chinese women and Latinx women and African-American women. I thought that was really fascinating. That's one thing I'd never heard that statistic. And I, you know, you know just that the, the longevity of how long those, that perimenopausal period is. Um, so that tells a very different story in, in some ways. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's really different for different women, but about 80% have serious, serious symptoms. Um, and that is more true for um, black and Hispanic women than it is for white women. Um, and it, it can last 10, 13 years which is something that I did not know. Yeah. Um, no, they don't tell us that in sex ed. Right? Well, I, or the doctor, like I went to the doctor every year. I did all the things I was supposed to do. The fact that I got to be 41 and I was like, why am I so mad sometimes? Why am I having these mood swings and weight gain and you know all, all this craziness? And yeah. then it, just, it took a lot of research. It took actually doing the book and then realizing, oh, this is why. So, And I like too how you put hormones fluctuation in there as one of the things that people kind of dismiss. Oh, she's just menopausal. She's not, you know, da, 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 right. Yet another historic way that women have been den denigrated, that we are our bodies, that we are these leaky vessels and what have you, right. That we're hysterical, right. We're, we're all about the womb at all stages of life, apparently. Right. Even when that womb doesn't bear children anymore. Um, so I found that really refreshing too, to add your voice to those who are naming um, those mythologies and, you know, those really sexist narratives about uh, the trajectory of women's lives and, yeah. you know, our, and our moods, right? So uh, I also, you know, I'm curious, I, I ha had a different experience of menopause while we're, while we're going there. <laughs> it's getting late. We're going there. I at 48 had breast cancer. And so I had chemo. And so menopause was like overnight, you know, it, I, it was compressed. So I don't really have the, I, it's sort of, what does this tell you you're talking about seven, 10 years, you know, it's a very different experience. And I think the experience for me of having breast cancer threw me into not being your poster girl, because it, you know, that was a crisis. Let's, you know, don't get me wrong. And it happened at midlife, but it was, also a reckoning and a, you know, a, a pivot point where life just came into high relief. The way that I think this pandemic is doing for a lot of people, we are living so close to our own mortality and that throws a completely different lens on how we live our days. Yeah, well, and it's, I have a lot of 
friends who are in their, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, um, who tell me that on the other side of all of this, there is this peace, there is this um, sense of really not caring what other people think, like way yeah. more than, than they did in their 40s, um, and of not having as much caretaking to do, and of just a lot more perspective and a lot more calm. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to that. I'm also looking forward to getting more radical. You know, Gloria Steinem famously said that women get more radical with age. So I'm like, keep it coming. You know, <laughs> let's, let's, let's blow this up. Let's not yeah. like be on a sinking boat. Let's like change the water, you know? Um, but I also love this quote that you quote from Pam Houston in her 2019 memoir, Deep Creek. Beautiful book. Right? And I love this quote so much so that I cut and pasted and put it on social media because I just <laughs> it's beautiful. Um, she says, there's another version, and this is her speaking to younger women, I think, right? I haven't read the book, so maybe you can set it up for me. But she says, there's another version after this version to look forward to because of wisdom or hormones or just enough years going by. If you live long enough, you quit chasing the things that hurt you. You eventually learn to hear the sound of your own voice. I love that. That like makes me teary almost, right? Because it's, I mean, it's just, you know, you learn to hear the sound of your own voice and that there are versions of ourselves and that, you know, we don't know who we'll be in another 10 years, right? Um, and well, hopefully I, we'll be even better. <laughs> and I just, I like the idea too, that maybe, maybe our job is not to like work harder and be more pleasing to everybody else and to, make these amazing advancements and this and that all at the same time while we look, you know, smoking hot. Um, maybe it's become <laughs> more ourselves, you know, maybe it's, it's something as deep as that. And maybe that will lead to all these other things, um, being amazingly nurturing or being um, a CEO or whatever it is, but that it's about looking inside for what we should be doing and not looking at this kind of barrage of messages like the, the Anjali, you know, curse. Yeah that damn perfume ad <laughs> now it's in my head, right? It's like, I love all the book tour saying it to me. I, you know, so I got a couple months in a book tour, which was like kind of these consciousness raising um, groups. It was really fun. Um, but almost every time I was in a room of more than 20 women, somebody would sing it. That was funny. That's amazing. And that's part of the delight of your book. I mean, it's just, it's a delight to read. Um, I, I told you before, I, I wish I'd written it. I loved it so much. That's rare, it's rare that you read a book that you're just like, oh, that was so good. I'm jealous, you know, <laughs> it was like, it was that good. And it's because it's the references of Gen X, just you bring it home, you know, the pop cultural references and um, as well as this like deeper narrative of the trajectory of our lives in the context of history um, or, you know, in relation to boomers and millennials and where we are right now. Um, and I think, you know, I, one thing I want to take away and just kind of make clear after reading your book is that, because I don't want anybody to walk away thinking that this is, a, that this is at all the message of your book, but, you know, I want to make it clear, this is not feminism's fault, right? This is the right. unfinished business that feminism began. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I love this quote from historian Gerda Lerner, who says that the only constant in women's history and feminist history seems to be a constant forgetting of our past. Mm -hmm. I think that there's this story in every generation of, you know, what did our mothers do? Oh, we don't want to be like our mothers. They, you know, they're exhausted and da, 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 whatever. They open pathways for us. Now we're exhausted. Now we're opening pathways out. They're going to be right. But it's also, it's not about feminism's failures, nor is it about our own. It's about a society that has not yet learned to support working families. I think well, well said. Do we, I think we get to take questions now. That was beautifully, beautifully sums up, I think. Let's take some questions. Hola. Hi, thanks. Good conversation, lots of great points and we have probably half a dozen questions here. So let's just get in it. Um, so from Renee asks, to what extent is this limited to Gen X versus women older and younger? Why did you choose that particular age group? So Gen X has been, sort of historically overlooked, um, uh, you know, it's a much smaller demographic, much smaller generation than boomers on one side and millennials on the other. And, and I think that both of those generations have so many flashpoints and news stories and, um, and movies and all this, you know, drama around them. And Gen X tends to just be marginalized. There was this Saturday Night Live skit, I don't know if you saw it, um, where it was like the, the millennial versus 
boomer teams. And then the host was Keenan Thompson, who was just like, who was the Gen X. He said, oh, I'm just Gen X. I just sit here and watch the world burn. That's my job. <laughs> so, um, so I was really interested in that as being of that generation that we didn't really have, and we didn't have a book. So I thought I'll do the, I'll do our book or one of our books. Okay, good. And Tanya asked, did social media come up in your interviews? How has social media impacted middle-aged women? Yeah, Tanya. So that's a good question. And it is, there's a whole chapter about social media because um, one thing that I saw over and over was this sense that women felt like they were failing. And when they explained why they thought that, one of the big reasons was they looked at social media and they saw everybody else had it figured out. Everybody else looked amazing. Like all their kids are Olympic gymnasts and their marriages are super hot and, you know, their careers are taking off and they're always on the beach somehow, even though they're, you know, <laughs> CEO you know, is weird. Um, and so, you know, I argue in the book that social media is, is part of this fake narrative that we've internalized um, and that we really have to kind of like deprogram ourselves about its, its reality. Okay, uh, this from Elise, she says she doesn't have a question, but she's shouting out to Deborah from a fellow Nutri class of 87 classmate. And parent of an only child. Her name is Elise Steiner. Oh, I remember you, Elise. Hi. <laughs> so you get a shout out there, Deborah. All right. Uh, recently, a thoughtful male told me that his son said he doesn't want to work as much as his dad does because he just misses too much. This is a dad with a struggling but passion-fueled entrepreneurial small business uh, from his 16-year-old son. So it must be a 16-year-old son who made this comment. Perhaps the boys we are raising are seeing this in all aspects of our overworking, high expectations parenting society. Yeah, that's interesting. And I, I think that that, um, that checks out with, with the studies I've seen about time use and, um, and about the changing, like changing demographics of caregivers. Like it's caregiving is traditionally done by women in their um, upper forties and fifties um, and it's almost always women. It's almost always like the women in the family. And that according to like ARP is changing. And you look at millennials and it's pretty even between men and women, which I found fascinating. So, so what do you think the daughters of Gen X women, um, what do you think they think about what uh, motherhood slash uh, professional life is it? What do you think they think watching Gen X women, their mothers? I mean, from what I've, from what I've heard, they, they want to do, um, they want to be happier. I think they want to be, you know, uh, calmer and, and happier. And it's funny because one of the women that I interviewed in the book, this woman in New Jersey, who she had three children. She, oh, she had kind of abandoned her career because of her, um, her kids. One of them had a traumatic brain injury and she always kind of felt disappointed in herself because she hadn't also, in addition to raising this family, um, and dealing with all these, these crises within it, um, hadn't also had this really flourishing career. And, and she came to one of my book events and she brought her daughter and she was like, Oh, look, it's me in the book. Um, and her daughter had said, you know, I hope you don't take this the wrong way. I don't want to be a stay at home mother you know, I want to, I want to do this and do that. And she had told her daughter, like, well, I just want you to be happy. I, I really just want you to be happy and whatever it's going to take, whatever combination of work and home, um, that's all I want for you. And she felt like that was for her. She felt like that was kind of breaking this cycle of achievement that she felt like she'd grown up with. Um, so. Hmm. It brings to mind a lot of different thoughts about the notion of happiness being uh, some kind of goal um, because it's actually not really a goal, is it? It's, yeah. Well, uh, that's a separate sidebar. No, we'll but say, it's a good question. We'll that for after hours. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You've hosted a lot of different people on that topic and there's a lot of different ways you can look at happiness as not necessarily being some kind of end state, but happiness is the side effect of living in an engaged, ethical, meaningful life. Yeah. As opposed to, I want my kid to be happy. It's like, well, it's a saying like, well, I, I want my kid to get a haircut. It's like, well, it's not just something you go buy, you know, though God, God knows we try many times. Uh, okay. Next question from Eileen. She says, I'm an old Gen Xer born 1965 with solid boomer siblings. Can you speak to how siblings who hail from different generations navigate their different feelings? Uh, I believe I solidly feel the loss, grief, et cetera, you talk about, but my sister born in 1957 doesn't and thinks I'm whining. Same <laughs> for my brother born in 1961. 
it's a real intra-family generational divide that affects everything, including how we raise our kids and help our mom. That is super interesting. I hope you're going to after hours so we can unpack that more. Um, but I will say that the, the accusation of whiny for just kind of laying out a feeling of despair. And, um, you know, I, I just, I have very little patience for that. I, I think that, um, you know, also you look at like how much time men's midlife crises and men's struggles have gotten, like, you know, um, how many Michael Douglas movies have been made about that feeling that I think we get to talk about it sometimes uh, of, about how we experience it. Um, but it is interesting about in within a family, I mean, I'm an only child, Gen X was a baby bust. So that's kind of one thing that defines it, right? Is this um, a lot, a lot less kids in that generation. Um, so yeah, but I'm fascinated by, by how it plays out in families. There's a question about how they want to learn, how can they learn more about your memoir writing classes? Would that be through your website, I would imagine? Oh yeah, I just do them sometimes. Like um, I do the Miami Book Fair, I've done that before, um, which is a great program. Whoever's teaching that is always wonderful. Uh, and then I've taught at Rutgers and a couple other places like in summer conferences. Is it the kind of thing though, like if Anne-Marie, our um, producer, if she puts the link to your website they can just go to your website and they can find when you're doing stuff like that. Would that be a correct? I don't statement? have any lined up right now, but yes, in the okay. I will post them there on my website. Okay, Thank you. Yeah. Very good. And then now we have um, Shelly asks, are men not exhausted? I'm divorced, so I don't have a reference point. If they aren't, how come? <laughs> are men exhausted? I think it's somebody else's book can talk about whether or not men are. I think they, I think they are, um, but I think anecdotally and from some of the research I've seen, they're, they're not putting quite as much pressure on themselves as women of this generation. Uh, and then from Tria, she says, did you talk with any women who opted to drop out of their careers to raise a family? Yes, there are several in there. Um, the, that New Jersey woman I mentioned is, her story is really interesting, I think, um, because she did so much. A lot of the women that I interviewed, they would wind up saying things like, what did I, where did I go wrong? What did I do wrong? Why didn't I do all the things? I'm supposed to have all the things. I don't have all the things. And the book is kind of debunks that idea that it's, um, first of all, necessary um, to have all the things or desirable or easy. Okay, so we're uh, two minutes out. Deborah, do you wanna wrap things around for us? Or Ada, you wanna, where where you wanna, where's the red ribbon to tie it all up? <laughs> do you have the red ribbon, Deborah? I'll find the red ribbon. I just, you know, I thank you, Ada. And I thank you, Lonnie, for bringing us together. I mean, I think this, we could talk all night and we will. Why don't you, actually, why don't you take a minute to tell how you two know each other. So we're both part of an author's group called the Invisible Institute in New York. And a lot of the authors come through FAN, but the Institute is invisible and doesn't really exist. It's you know just a network of support. We're both gonna get shot because you mentioned it now, but yes. It's gonna, right. Uh -oh. But there's no website. You can't find, you know, it's sort of like a, right? But I, I think it was founded um, by women and I was one of the early generation people and then I moved. Uh, but I think it is one of those places where, you know, it's, it, I mean, it's women and men, but sharing resources and insider knowledge and context about what it is to be a writer in this day and time. Um, so I, I think that that's a, net, a professional network that has been, you know, fundamental for us both probably. Yeah, no, it's been really wonderful. And, and I've met a lot of wonderful people, including you. And I'm so grateful to you for doing this and to Lonnie for having us. Um, it was great. Well, thanks everyone for coming. 